Okay, so I wanna welcome everyone to the seminar series for the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative, since there are gonna be several people here from outside of Vanderbilt. Um, the Vanderbilt Microbiome Initiative is a community of about 300 people spanning undergraduates to faculty across six schools at Vanderbilt University. It was established in 2020, or sorry, established in 2020. The Postdoc Association is proud to welcome Dr. Lay as the 2021 invited speaker in association with VI4 and Vanderbilt microbiome research communities. Dr. Ruth Lay is the director of the Department of Microbiome Science at Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen. And it's a position she's held since 2016. Prior to that, she held positions at Cornell University and the Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Lay is one of the world's leading experts on human microbiome research, and we're really lucky to have her here today. Early in her career, she authored many of the foundational papers on the evolution of the mammalian microbiome, the role of the human microbiome in obesity, and interactions between humans and their gut microbiota. Her current research in her lab includes evolution of the human gut microbiome and interplay with host genetics, the role of lipids in host microbiome symbioses, and microbiota innate immune system interactions. Now, she's received countless awards over the course of her career. Um, some more recent ones include the Ernst Jung Prize for Medicine in 2018 and the Otto Bayer Award in 2020. She's a member of EMBO and she's a fellow of the European Academy of Microbiology as well as the American Academy of Microbiology. And she was recently elected to the German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina in 2020. So we're really excited to have Dr. Lay here today. Um, she's going to be, sorry, as I switch my screen back, she's going to be talking to us about the human gut microbiota in relation to human genotype. So, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Liz, for the really nice introduction. Um, um, thank you, Seth, and uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, thank you for the postdocs to, to inviting me to your, to your series. Um, and it's, it's been really nice, uh, really wonderful chatting with you for, for the last hour or so. Uh, so as, as Liz mentioned, um, I was at Cornell for um, eight years prior to moving to, to Germany. And so just to, so you have an idea where I am, I'm in um, Southwest Germany here in, in the small town of Tübingen, one of the Max Planck um, Society's campuses. We have three separate institutes together here, mine, which is developmental biology and um, a, a couple of others. And so, um, I moved here in 2016 and set up a group that focuses almost exclusively on the gut microbiome. So let me just thank the people whose work I'm gonna to present to you now. Um, this is the group as it's kind of evolved over the years and um, I'm showing you some of the some of the people who go back a few years, like this was taken at Cornell because I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, sort of integrate some of the work that that these people have done over a number of years. And so I'd like to, to acknowledge that they are the people who, who did everything I'm gonna talk about. And I'm gonna talk about the gut microbiome. And the way I use this word is to just mean microbial communities. That's how I use the word. Um, I just mean a bunch of microbes and I'm really focusing on the gut microbes. So when I talk about the microbiome, I mean um, the collective microbes in the, in the gut. So I don't think I need to tell you guys that, um, that we're born um, this, this large sterile object that's rapidly colonized by, by the people around us. And um, of course, we're also, my, sorry, my phone's buzzing. We're also exposed to um, environmental microbes during this time, but it, uh, our microbiome really is uh, mostly human and, and it's, it's seeded really by, by the people that we grow up with. And it increases in complexity and um, diversity and biomass until, until we're adults. And it's influenced by health, lifestyle, diet, um, our community. Um, and I'm sure you're, you're, you're very familiar with, um, with, with the decades of work now that's gone into elucidating some of these patterns. What we were interested in um, when I started my lab at Cornell is whether host genetics could, could have any effect on, on what we saw in, in the adult um, gut microbiome. So our question was, do people have any kind of genetic predisposition for some form of microbiome composition, some aspect of it, um, or not? 
And coming into this, um, this was the background. Um, the answer was no. This was um, a paper um, from my postdoctoral lab working with Jeff Gordon. They had, we, we had looked at um, 54 samples that came from uh, monozygotic mono, mono and dizygotic twins. And that this is beta diversity measures giving an overall idea of how similar or different the overall microbiome composition was. And the answer was for these different kinds of twins, there was really no difference in microbiome composition. And um, when I started my lab, we thought maybe this was because it's a gross measure and it was underpowered and maybe there's more here to find. And so um, <clears throat> we did this paper that was published in 2014. And I'll, I'll keep referring to this paper because I wanna show what we've done since and use it as a sort of a baseline. So we took the microbiomes of a thousand twin pairs. Um, so hundreds of fraternal and, and identical twin pairs. And this was um, Julia Goodrich, a really amazing student in the lab um, led this. And so we um, generated microbiomes by 16S profiling. And these are P uh, twins that came out of the Twins UK population from Tim Spector's King's College London group. So, so what we were looking for uh, is the relative abundances of taxa uh, for twin pairs that are either a dizygotic or monozygotic. And, and monozygotic twin pairs, um, the idea is that if there's variance um, within the twin pair for a trait, that that's going to come from environmental factors alone because they share a genotype. Whereas if they're dizygotic, there's going to be an influence of uh, the host genotype as well because they share half their genes on average. And so you can use these kinds of patterns um, and, and, and do some modeling and figure out just how strong this genotype effect is. And that's called heritability. And, and heritability is um, a confusing word for people because it sounds like it's, it's too similar to the word inherited, but it's, it's heritable in terms of the genes. Um, so like height is heritable because you have the genes from your parents that confer height. Same, same idea here for the microbes. So it's nothing to do with inherited um, heritable meaning what's what's the strength of the genetic predisposition for the relative abundance of all these taxa. And so Julia summarized the data here in this one figure. So, so she, she ran these models for every single uh, microbe she could quantify across these people. And now she's colored the strength of the heritability onto this. Um, and if it's blue or green, it, it really is um, not significant. And so you can see that for the, for the majority, it's not significant. It's a lot of blue and green. Okay. Um, so that means a lot of environmental influence on, on these microbes, which is what we'd expect. Um, but you see these, these uh, red branches peeking through. And so that means that for a select set of these taxa, there is an effect of the host genotype on the variance in the relative abundance of these taxa across the population. And um, this is um, a list of a lot of them. And the ones that are listed here that, that have this significant heritability, um, they're listed here because uh, at least one other study also found them in their study of heritability. So um, this is already uh, aging. So in 2017, um, we looked at what had come out since our paper and uh, compiled it here. And so what was really neat for us to see is that again and again and again, you have the same heritable taxa popping up. And so these are where some of these studies are from. And so that was uh, really an indication that this, that, that this wasn't just unique to Twins UK or wasn't a fluke that um, these are coming up again and again as heritable in, in different studies around the world. And I'm gonna focus uh, in the first half of my talk on two uh, of these in particular, the, the family Christensenaceae and the genus Methanobrevibacter, and you'll see why in a minute. And this is why. <laughs> so the reason I'm gonna focus on these is because um, first of all, the family Christensenaceae is the most highly heritable taxon in our, in our study. Um, and it, what we found is it, 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 it formed the hub of a co-occurrence network. So it's co-occurring with these other things, um, among which is um, the Methanobacteriaceae, and this is really driven by the genus Methanobrevibacter and, and Methanobrevibacter smithii, which is the, um, the dominant archaeon in the human gut. 
So what this is showing is that they co-occur across the population and, the, and they're all heritable together. So we have this little co-occurring um, heritable consortium. And since then, so this is a paper we published last year, we've, we've gone looking to see if they, if they co-occur in, in other data sets. So focusing on Chris and Sinaliaceae, or it doesn't matter if you focus on the genus or, or the family, because it's all, uh, you get the same patterns. Um, these two in particular, are they co-occurring? And so this time we're mining metagenomes um, and looking for, their, for, for genomes of these taxa. And we're finding that yes, they, they're highly correlated across a number of, of different um, metagenome sets that we were able to pull together. And another thing um, that really surprised us when we started focusing in on, on these, these two is that um, not only do they co-occur, but they're more abundant in, in people with a lean um, phenotype with a low BMI. And this again is something that we saw when we went in and um, took a look across these close to 2000 metagenomes that had um, other data um, that, that, that we could look at such as age and BMI. Again, um, these are both really prevalent, they're correlated and they correlate with a low BMI ac across populations. So we, um, we've kept track also of where these Christensiaceae bacteria pop up. And we find that they are widespread um, and they're associated with health over and over again. And so this is an example. Um, this is a number of studies that have now found an association between uh, uh, the Christensiaceae and a low BMI. And so this was in 2019 that we published this. And, and just the other day for fun, we because uh, we, we keep track of these studies, this is um, studies reporting an association with a low BMI and where they're coming from. So they're, they're coming from different parts of the world, um, including the Middle East and, and Asia. And if you open it up to not just BMI, but other healthy metabolic states, such as low levels of triglycerides and things like this, um, there's even more studies. So, so, so this is intriguing um, that they're, they seem to be a marker for health. Um, what's, what's been interesting though, is that, uh, and this is a, um, this is something that is a, a, a temporary issue. I think it's going to go away, but um, when we're mining the literature for these kinds of associations, we find them in studies that use 16 S uh, because 60, because Kristen Sliatia is in the 16 S databases. Um, but a lot of the metagenome studies that have come out. So including another one from twins UK, they never mention Christensiaceae, and you're thinking, what happened? Where did it go? And in fact, the problem is that Metaflan 2, which is one of the databases that people use the most in their metagenome analyses, doesn't have Christensiaceae in it. And so there's a, a number of papers like this that, that are really recent and, and report all these associations, and these guys are, are missing. Um, it's, I said it's going to go away because it is being incorporated. Um, we, uh, we couldn't wait, we, we, uh, we needed to, to be able to see it. And so we actually developed a, a tool for this for, for customizing your database for these common metagenome profilers. So if you need to do this, if your favorite microbe isn't represented in the common uh, metagenome databases that come with the profilers, it's actually not that hard um, to, to use this. And, and to make your own. And we've just made it more efficient. This is the, uh, the second iteration of this that Nick Youngblood in the lab, um, who's, who's, our, who's our sort of lead bioinformatician just put out. So shout out to this if, if you need this as well. And, and I, um, I hope that Chris and C.A. Shea will come back into the papers now because it'll be, it'll be under the, the lampshade again for people. Um, okay, but back to, um, back to, back to the biology. Um, we wanted to test whether the associations that we see here um, are, um, are exemplary of um, an interaction or not, or if, if they're really just co-occurring for, for other reasons, like they, they like the same conditions. And so we've worked with Chris and Sidella Minuta, which is the type strain for the, for the group. Um, there's a few um, cultured representatives that you can work with that you can obtain from culture collections for this group. There's also a big diversity that's coming out of metagenome, assembled genomes. There's really interesting mags 
thousands of them that we and others have, have found. Um, and so this is a, a group I think that's rich for, for trying to get more isolates. Um, but for the time being, we're, we're really working with Kristen Stella Minuto, which was the first one that was um, deposited and described in 2014 by Moritomi et al. And it really is just um, a little fermenter. Um, <clears throat> it, it doesn't, it's, it's a fairly typical firmicute in, in that sense. And then we work with the Thanabravi Bacter smithii, which takes hydrogen and CO2 or formate and CO2 and makes hydrogen and, and is the, the most common um, archaeon in the, in the human gut. And so we thought that they might be cross-feeding with hydrogen. Um, and so we've tested this. Um, and this is the work of Sophia Elizondo in the lab. And this is what happens when you grow them together. Chris and Sinella by itself will form a really thick, gooey biofilm. And, and adding in methanobrevibacter, it just goes right in there and nestles in with it. So, so the ones that form the rosettes are uh, Simunuda and the ones that are these fatter ones, um, this is the methanogen. There's fewer of them. So, so this is what they look like. Sorry, Sorry Ruth. Um, are you, we have questions coming in through the chat. Are you open oh. to having questions as we go or would you like to hold them all to the end? Uh, maybe hold them to the end because okay. I'm a little worried about time. We can definitely do that. Sorry, I'm, uh, well, well, I should have too many slides. To <laughs> I should have asked you at the beginning. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so by 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 epifluorescence microscopy, see we do here is in green. Um, M is in the uh, <clears throat> fluorescing here, and this is in a bottle. And so if you if you put them in a bottle, you'll get hydrogen build up over a couple of days, and then it's drawn down, and you have meth methane being produced. And so M is the is incredibly easy to grow just by um, throwing it in um, with C. minuta. So um, in, in order to better understand how they're interacting, we've started growing them in bioreactors so that we can keep them in steady state with glucose as the sole fermentable carbon source. And the data I'm going to be showing you also has hydrogen and CO2 in excess um, so that we could compare to M. smithii alone. And both grow better together. So there's more glucose consumed and more biomass when they're together than when they're alone. So in this case, this, this is uh, living off of hydrogen and CO2. Here, this guy, Simonid, uh, is living off of glucose. Um, but both of them do better together, even M. smithii um, with excess hydrogen and CO2 in the medium. Um, here we're showing you a time series, showing you acetate, butyrate, and glucose over time. Um, so in, in the gray bar, it's um, setting up. Uh, you can think of it as more like batch culture. And then this is continuous culture. So the, the glucose is completely consumed. And during this time, there's acetate produced, whether C. minuta is alone or in the dark blue if it's in co-culture. But what's really neat to see here is that um, this is butyrate produced by C. minuta alone. And this is butyrate produced by C. minuta when it's got the methanogen with it. And so there's something about methanogen presence that is redirecting um, the metabolic output of C. minuta and it's not making uh, butyrate anymore, it, it shuts it down. And so we're busy now um, trying to understand the electron flow through this system. Um, so it looks like both partners benefit um, and this M. smithii definitely uses the hydrogen produced by C. minuta even when there's excess hydrogen in the system. And, and one of the questions we have that we haven't answered yet is, is when these are present and there's a lot of them in the system, is, is there less energy available to the host? Um, we, the, the, first way, the first way we sort of, uh, the first approach we took to seeing if C. minuta could affect the host um, was back in the 2014 paper. We took a, a sample from an obese human donor that had, um, undetectable Christensiaceae, and we, we added it live or dead and mixed it in. And then these went into replicate germ-free mice. And, and what we saw is that the mice receiving Christensenella, so this is PBS control, but it, it works with killed Christensenella as well. Um, we see lower levels of, uh, of um, adiposity in the animals and they don't gain as much weight. And we see a little less acetate in, in the cecum after three weeks. So 
we've we've repeated the experiment here. So our move from Cornell interrupted this a little bit, but then we set up our germ-free facility and did it again. And this time we have 16 mice um, shown here, and we've done this three times, males and females. And we see again um, that when Cristinel is added live, the mice typically on average um, have less adiposity. But what we've been able to do also is phenotype their behaviors by put, putting them in, these, in this Promethean cage system where we can see if their activity changes. And so this is automatic um, monitoring of activity and, and how much they interact with the, hop, the, the water hopper and things like this. Um, and so this is data for females, day and night activity. And so uh, what we're finding is during the day, which is when they sleep, the activity for these two treatment groups is the same. But at night, when they're running around, um, the ones that get live Cristinella run around even more. So they don't nap during their active time as much as the ones that got heat killed Cristinella. Um, also, they, they essentially fidget more. So this is time spent interacting with the water hopper. And even though they're not drinking more, they're rearing up and tapping it and things like this more. Now for the males, we see something slightly different, but we see um, that they also spend more time at the water hopper and we have um, a trend that they're running more. So it looks like Christmas and Ella somehow uh, um, affecting their activity. And this is something of course that we're now looking into um, and we, we don't know why. But um, so this baseline study I've been telling you about um, identified heritable microbes, um, led us to look at Cristinella as this um, uh, co-occurring with other things such as M. smithii. Um, they were both associated with leanness. And I put big checks next to those because those have been seen again in, in, different, in a lot of different studies. I put a small check next to th this effect of adding it to mice because we're the only ones that have, with, uh, that have done this again. I haven't seen anyone else actually do this experiment. But, but we're busy now looking into um, why this might be happening. And it, it might not just be a pure ener you know, um, energy conversion equation, which is what I was originally thinking. Um, and it, it might um, have to do with something that influences their behavior um, that, that is just slightly changing their, their energy balance. We don't know. So um, these microbes are heritable, meaning there's some kind of um, genetic component to the variants in their distribution. And what one can do is search for the genes underlying this. Um, um, and our, the twins that we looked at were genotyped, and so we ran a GWAS. And so what we would be doing here is for each and every microbe that we have relative abundances of the taxa across the twins, we can see if at every particular um, position where we know the what the SNP is, we, we can see if there's a, a pattern of the relative abundance of the microbes that, that matches this. And then you have to do it for all 2 million SNPs, um, which is a lot of tests. And so your statistical bar that you have to clear to find something significant becomes um, very high. And uh, we can't find anything for Crystinsiaceae and Methanobacteriaceae or, or uh, most of the others actually. And that's, uh, that. well, it's probably not that surprising because, um, with with 3000 samples in a GWAS, it's it's really, 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 really underpowered. But despite that, and I'm going to use that to pivot now to talk about something slightly different. Despite that, bifidobacterium in every single underpowered GWAS has always given a signal. And um, that's something that's been seen again and again, no matter how small the study is. So bifidobacterium is one of these heritable microbes, as you might expect, because now it's even, it's even got a signal in the, in the GWAS. And if you zoom in, um, it's, um, it's an area on chromosome two that's giving these, these really significant p-values. And it's, it's, the, it's the area of the genome of the LCT gene that codes for, um, it's the lactase persistence locus. So this is the one that's going to determine whether or not um, the individual is still able to produce lactase as an adult. And so this is something that's been seen uh, time and time again 
in um, people of European descent. And what is probably happening is that um, if you have the genotype for lactase non-persistence, so, so you're, you're not making lactase as an adult and you drink the milk sugar lactose, um, the bifidobacteria will uh, essentially grow on this and you'll have more of them compared to someone who is making lactase and is able to metabolize lactose themselves um, and not leave any for the bifidobacteria. So this seems like a, a fairly straightforward story of bifidobacteria compensating for an, an enzyme either being there or not being there and taking over that role in the gut for the host. Um, the, all of the GWAS studies um, will, will indicate that it's bifidobacterium, the genus um, that associates with this, uh, with this uh, locus. And we, we went looking to see which species it was by looking at metagenomes more closely from our UK twins that were either AA or GG. And so AA are the ones with fewer bifidos, GG are the lactase non-persistent genotype with more bifidos. And really it made no difference. We found the same species ranking of these bifidos. Um, there were just more of them in the GG genotype. And so Victor Schmidt, who did this study, um, thinks of it as uh, rising tide lifts all boats. There's just more of all of the bifidos in the GG genotype. Of course, that wasn't satisfying. So we went looking for strange. Um, which we couldn't do with straight up metagenomes because we didn't have the coverage. So Victor built a capture array and pulled out bifidobacteria DNA and got a 30 fold enrichment of bifidobacterium DNA from the metagenomes by doing this and shotgun sequenced that and looked for strain differences by, genotype, by human genotype. And there was still no difference. So uh, this is Hage Nav. He developed a synthesis based tool for comparing strains. Um, when we can see that twins share uh, similar strains and the same person over time is going to have similar strains. It's shown here, self versus within twins. Um, but by genotype, uh, it didn't make a difference at all if you were GG or, or, or not. So um, yeah, all, all the time we spent looking for, for <laughs> for refinement in the signal gave us nothing. Basically, you, uh, it seems like uh, people, it really is just the bifidos in general do better um, when lactose is able to reach where they are. And, and this, so lactose persistence is something that arose different places in the world over time. Um, um, in, in Europe, in North Africa, in, in, uh, also in, 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 in Eastern Siberia. Um, and, and it's one of the strongest signals of recent selection on, on human populations. And um, it's also the biggest signal in this microbiome uh, genome association that we see. And it, th that's probably not a coincidence. And it got us thinking about whether we should use um, this, this, these strong markers of selection from human genetic studies to look for microbiome human genotype associations. So this is a really nice summary from Sarah Tishkoff's lab showing um, the, the, the kinds of uh, mark, um, evidence of selection around the world on different populations as they adapted to their local conditions. Uh, so this is lactase persistence coming out of a couple places, but then there's other things uh, like adapt, uh, adaptation to cold or adaptation to, to pathogens that geneticists have been able to, to see in, in human populations. And so can we use this as a roadmap to go looking for genotype microbiome interactions? We have looked at one other one so far, and this is um, a, a, a related to, to starchy food consumption. And it's the amylase, um, salivary amylase enzyme. So um, when you digest um, starch, uh, you do it with amylase uh, produced by the pancreas and also salivary amylase here begins the process of starch digestion in the mouth. And these enzymes will break starch into glucose. Of course, your gut microbes are loaded with amylases and if they get a hold of glucose, they'll make short-change fatty acids, which is less energetically favorable. 
So it looks like we're in competition for our microbes for this. And what's really interesting about humans and dogs is that, that there's been duplication of the Amy one locus. So that uh, if, if you look across human populations, uh, people vary in copy number from two to 20. And this has a direct effect on how much amylase is produced in the mouth. And you can, this is fake data, but you can generate something that looks almost exactly like this yourself, where the, the AMI1 copy number um, relates directly to, to the um, amylase activity in the mouth. So, so we wondered, what, what does the gut microbiome of someone with high copy number look versus low copy number? Because this is a very different um, conditioning. Um, you, you'd think that there'd be less of these starches reaching the distal gut in people with a high copy number. And so, so how does that look? And one of the ways we looked at it was to go back to our twins. We had microbiomes for 3,000 people. Um, we picked 1,000 subjects with a normal BMI. And there are actually SNPs that are predictive of Amy one copy number. You, you have to go in and measure this separately um, normally, but, but there's there are SNPs that are predictive, and so we used that. And then, uh, so we predicted everyone's copy number, then we ranked them, and we took the, the ends of the distribution, compared the microbiomes, and found that the people with a high copy number had more room in a pocket. And then Angela Poole, my postdoc from Cornell, who's now faculty there, um, grabbed 100 Cornell University students off the campus. Well, actually, they came willingly, and you'll see why. But um, she, she looked at their copy number, and this is the, the distribution of the amylase copy number. For, for, it was getting really high for, for some of these kids. And um, we, then, we then enrolled them, 25 of them in this study where we, we monitored what they ate for a month. And in the middle two weeks, we, we fed them a standardized diet and uh, they gave us stool and saliva samples over the course of this month and we paid them every time. So this was really popular because we, we made them basically eat starch. We didn't want anyone on the paleo diet or the, you know, we wanted to just make sure that they, they were getting plenty of starch. And so they, they had pancakes and all kinds of things. And, and then we compared their microbiomes over this, this time course. And I've, I've heard you've also, uh, in Seth's lab, done, done some of this uh, feeding intervention with, with undergraduates. And what, what we saw is actually during that two week period, the, um, the beta diversity shrank, they became more similar. But despite that, um, we could see that the higher Amy one copy number people actually had more ruminococcus like we'd seen in the twins. They also had more short chain fatty acids and, and we could see shifts in some of these carbohydrate active genes as well. Um, but then we did this experiment where we, we took um, microbiomes from the 25 people and we had multiple time points from them and we did one-to-one -one donor to mouse transfers. So now we're taking humans with high or low copy number and they're all lean, okay? And we're, tra we're, we're doing one-to-one -one transfers into mice. And the mouse now has copy number of two and is on a polysaccharide rich diet. And so is this gonna make a difference that the microbiome is coming from someone conditioned with a high amylase or low amylase? And it turns out it does. Um, the, the mice that got the microbes from a high amylase donor um, had higher body fat. And this does make um, some sense if you think about it like this. So if you have low copies of the amylase gene, you're letting that starch reach the gut microbes and they'll take it. <laughs> um, if you have high copy numbers, this starch is not reaching them and you're gonna have more of these polysaccharides with other kinds of linkages um, being the only thing, um, or you'll have maybe proportionally more of that reaching the gut microbes. And this is now selecting for ruminococcus, which are known to, to go after resistant starch. So this is the way we think of it, um, that there's, there's um, that the, the ruminococcus is gonna be more selected for in these hosts that have depleted these, these uh, easier starches, if you will. And we see that reflected in this functional output in, in the mice. So this is another example where, where we, can, we can begin with um, 
human variation that we that we in genotype that we know has been selected for um, as as part of a, a local adaptation, and um, so we have from the geneticists um, a map of these to work with, and we, you can actually go through the literature and for for all of these different um, genotypes, you can you can find microbiome studies where they've uh, they've compared genotypes at that particular part of the genome and they've been able to see some pattern in the microbiome and it it, it, it starts to make you wonder if um, if these these microbiome shifts that you see reflecting the the genotype differences if if this is telling us anything about how the microbes help or somehow uh, maybe slow down or speed up or what how they might be interacting with the host as it encounters a, a new environment. Um, so linked to that is this idea of, of dispersal that people, when they came out of Africa and spread around the globe, um, may have carried their microbes with us, uh, with them, with us. And, and in fact, we know this from, from this beautiful work with H. pylori that the H. pylori researchers have done um, with, where they, they looked at patterns of strains across the world and they're consistent with patterns of migration and that's consistent with vertebral, vertical transmission of H. pylori um, tightly over generations. And as people carried their helicobacters with them, now you can, you can see these patterns reflected in the, in the strain variation. And so we've been wondering if there's other gut microbes that we could find this kind of pattern for. Um, we know from the work of Howard Alkman and Annie Mueller, who's now at Cornell, that um, there's evidence for this in, in, the, in the primates. So they used gyrase B and they were able to, to build these trees for some of these different species, um, including the bifidobacteria. And these, these trees of the bacteria match the phylogeny of the host. So this, this is consistent with a co-diversification and that these bifidobacteria may have gone along for the ride as the, um, as the primates speciated over, over these, these long periods of time. And so, so what we wanna be doing now is, is looking for co-diversification um, in other gut bacteria um, within humans. Um, so we're looking for patterns like this, where the, the phylogeny of the hosts and the, and the phylogeny of the um, different bacteria that we're looking for um, have a matching pattern that's not what you'd expect by chance. So <clears throat> of course you can get a pattern like this by chance through, through environmental, um, environmental uh, filtering, but, um, or you can, but um, there's, there's tools for, for comparing the tree structures that, that we can start to apply. So we know from others work, like Nicola Sagata's lab, that there's definitely different dominant strains. Um, again, bifidobacteria, there's different dominant strains in different countries, the different populations around the world. And uh, the question now is, can we actually attribute that to, um, to the, the ancestry of the people or, or is, it, um, is it driven by environmental factors alone? Um, so we can build trees of humans. So here's a human super tree, for instance. Um, and, and what we'd like to do is match those to, to microbial trees. Um, so we need matching sets of metagenomes and genotypes. So we've, we've started to collect some of these um, we have matching sets for Germany, Gabon, and Vietnam that we've started to work with. So this is um, work by Victor Schmidt and Liam Fitzstevens and Mirabeau Mong, um, who, were, who were looking at um, lactose tolerance in lactose intolerant populations, um, but we also genotyped, in this case, mothers and um, collected stool samples from mothers and their kids. So um, we, can, we can make human um, trees from, from the adult data. And then we can go through and make trees from, from um, a number of taxa from our metagenomes um, using here strain flan. So we've got about 60 taxa we can do this with. And for each one of those, we can compare the microbial tree to the host tree 
and ask if they're more similar than, than what you'd expect. And so this is what our, our human data look like. We've got um, our Gabonese individuals, followed by uh, our Asia population, followed by our Germans and the twins, UK people we threw in here as well. So here are Europeans. So this is uh, a three population tree with Africa basal that we have from our people. And um, here are some of the patterns that we see in, in the microbiota. So here's for instance, a colincella with uh, each one of these branches is now a strain. So we have the clustering by Africa basal and then um, Asian and then the Europeans. Here again, Africa basal and the uh, uh, Asians, and then here we have a little Africa basil followed by the Europeans with some others interspersed. And so we, we, can, we can look at these by eye, um, but, but we can also run these statistical tests to ask if the trees are more, more uh, uh, similar than you'd expect by chance. And so here are some of the, the taxa that are emerging as, as having these significant values for, 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 for um, congruent trees. And so you have things like Eubacterium prevotella copri, Methanobrevibacter um, coming out as significant in these kinds of comparisons, of tree comparisons. We can, I won't show you this, but we can also do it within a population, which is maybe a little more convincing. Um, and we, we see some of these uh, popping out within population as well. We can also look at the, and these are very new data because uh, we're really working through this now, but we've, we're looking at the mother genotype against the baby microbiome and there's, there's a lot of bifidos there and, and we see the same kind of thing. Um, so, so now this is the mother's genotype predicting the baby's bifidos and we have, um, we have Africa basal. Uh, every time you have this new clade, you see Africa basal followed by, um, followed by Asia here um, followed by European here. So, so, so these are also showing us so, some, some interesting patterns. And if you look at the babies, um, the, the top most significant are also a lot of these bifidos, also Provotella copri. So, so there's not much overlap between the human, the, sorry, the adult and baby data sets because they have pretty different microbiomes. But the one that's popping up in both and is significantly co-diversifying is Provotella copri. So it, it's a fascinating microbe. And if you're working on that, this is a, another reason it's a fascinating microbe. We, we've wanted to add more data, so we've we've added in um, a few, you know, uh, 1,300 or so uh, metagenomes um, and primate strains and. Um, so here's, for instance, Provotella copri as well. And what we're looking for, for example, is Africa red being basal in each one of these little clusters. You can see that. This cluster here, though, is pretty interesting in that you have African strains in the middle of the Asian ones. And the outer ring is telling us where they're from. And they're from Madagascar. Uh, so all of these are from Madagascar. And, and what's really interesting about Madagascar is that it's been populated both from Africa and from Asia. And it looks from this that people brought their Prevotella copris from Asia. Um, here's Eubacterium rectali with, with Africa basil, Africa basil. Um, so, so you can see things by eye, but then um, we, we'll be running the stats on this as well. Um, Right, each one of these wedges is showing you an Africa basal strain. Um, where we could, we've actually added in primate strains, which should be basal to every human, so all of the humans, and that's exactly what we see. So the bright pink is primate, and they root all of the human ones. So these, this is an ongoing analysis um, that I wanted to share with you, and we'll have more details on this later. But it, it's giving us a, a, a list of taxa that, that there's evidence that's consistent with co-diversification between and within these populations. We can support this by adding additional human populations and some primate species. And, and we, this is consistent with the effect of long-term vertical transmission, uh, same ideas for H. pylori um, for, some of, for a subset of the microbes that we can detect. And it, it really raises questions about um, if there's anything really special about the ones that have co-diversified with us and, um, and what might be going on in some 
now that we're mixing more, for example, are we gonna be losing some of these signals? So we know um, from work by a lot of other groups that there's this vertical transmission microbes sharing within families, for instance, bifidobacteria that keeps coming up is really known for this. Um, <clears throat> we know from, from work of H. pylori researchers that microbes can be carried um, vertically transmitted over generations and carried around. And, and I think we're going to be, uh, as we fill in data sets, seeing more other types of microbes besides H. pylori for which this is true. And then as people encounter different environments and adapted genetically to local conditions, it's fascinating to think about how microbes might have played a role in that one way or another, either by slowing the process down, speeding the process up. But, but what we can see now, of course, um, for some of these, and we'll be looking for more, is that um, wherever you see it, well, at least for two examples, and we'll see if there's more, if there's uh, evidence of selection on, on, on the human genotype, we might see that mirrored um, in the microbiome as well. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. And I'd like to thank uh, the people who funded the work and the Max Planck that's funding us going forward and um, the group here who's been working on this, whose work I showed you and our partners from Cornell and, and London and, and recently the University of Tübingen um, and their Institute for Tropical Medicine and, and their partners in Gabon and, and Vietnam. So with that, I'll, I'll take the questions that you guys have been putting in the chat and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, so we'll try to work our way through the questions in the chat. Um, I think some of Steph, or some of Seth's students have asked many, many questions. So for those students, if you could limit things to one question per person, pick your favorite question, that would be awesome. Um, so we'll start with James Houdelet, and he had a question about BMI. So you can just unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I guess my question uh, was very early on and uh, was partially answered um, during the, the class. But I mean, um, you mainly looked at uh, the uh, variance of um, microbial population as a function of genetic um, adaptation to different environments and how this uh, shapes at the beginning and uh, of the presentation, uh, this shapes uh, the, the, the not shape, predicts the BMI of uh, mice and uh, human populations. But I guess, can't we make the opposite argument? It's because they had this microbiome that, they, that those that had this uh, genotype were selected in a certain environment. I, yeah, I, th I think you could, yes, I, I think they, they can feed back on each other. Um, so, so I think by, by using the germ-free animals, we're trying to isolate the effect of the microbes on the host, but I, I think you're right. They could they could definitely feed back on each other, yeah, and maintain it that way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. And then we have a question from Dr. Drake. Um, Dr. Drake, did you want to ask your question, or I can read it out? Yes, I was just wondering. I thought it was really fascinating. Um, the idea that. Um, the Christelle, I'm not quite sure how you say it, the bacterium was associated with health. So I had two questions because there's all this data about how diet affects your microbiome. So I'm wondering if you've looked at patients who have a low BMI but poor nutrition, and do you still see this bacterium present? That would be so, the thing to do, I think. So so I I suspect that diet might have a lot to do with it, um, but we don't have definitive evidence. So I, I think what you're suggesting would be the thing to do. And we haven't done that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. And then Ian Houdela is next on our list of questions. Yes. So um, towards the end of the lecture, I had a question. What about convergent evolution? Like, have you seen from different species living in the same extreme environment, uh, a, converge, a, con a convergence, sorry, in microbiome, maybe not uh, strains level or species level, but maybe more at like the metagenomic level, like genes present in the microbiome of different species. So for instance, in the, in the Arctic, have you seen like convergence between human microbiome and polar bear microbiome 
and seals or things like that. Oh, so um, we haven't looked, um, but I would think you would see that kind of thing by by gut physiology generally. Um, but um, an, an actual sort of, uh, to, to really show that it, it, convergent evolution, I see. So, so you might want to take like a carnivore from, from a, two very different mammalian lineages or something like that, right? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of that, but maybe someone else can think of that. I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Uh, for, for, I, I think you, you, you're going to have microbes that are just going to find their niche and don't really care so much who it's in and then you're going to have other microbes that are somehow more tightly associated with the host um so so i think if you look for things like this you can you can probably find it it'll, it'll be a different set of microbes involved i would think okay thank you very much okay and next we have dalton nelson yeah so my question is a little bit uh adjacent to the primary work so forgive me Coming okay. from an engineering background, but I was interested. Uh, you were using the bioreactor. Do you have mm -hmm. some means of like doing a real time or somewhat real time analysis to make sure that your cells are proliferating? Oh well, they'd be washed out if they weren't. So 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 with the continuous flow, there's always um, there's always some removal of cells that 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 happens. So if they didn't grow, they would they would just get flushed out by the system. They they have to. To be there, they have to be growing. They're they're in exponential phase the whole time. Okay, thank you. I was muted. Our next question is from Sabrina Spicer. Um, yeah, I guess I was just more wondering in the first mouse experiment that you described, what was the advantage of using the dead microbe as opposed to just a PBS control? Oh, um, I, th I think with that, it's just a test if there's some protein or something that, um, um, that the microbe might be carrying that's, that's having this effect. So for instance, I think with acromancia, when they've done similar, similar types of experiments, I think that he killed would still confer the effect they were looking at. And so that, that actually led them to look for a particular protein. But with us, um, it looked like it had to be alive to, to do this. It had to be alive and persistent. And so it's Perfect. still there later on, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Great, and our next question is from Jennifer Silverman. Hey, I don't uh, totally remember what I asked, but I think it was about the sex differences in the mice with the Cristinella bacteria. Yeah. I was wondering if, um, you know, you know, any like reason why you would see differences in activity. I don't know. I'm a bit out of my league when it comes to activity and mice. So if anyone in the audience has ideas, I'd love to hear them. We'll, we'll try to figure that out. It, it invokes uh, hormones, you know, maybe there's, there's something going on with, uh, I, I don't even, wouldn't know how to start speculating, to be honest. So we might- You said they were consuming more water. Were they also retaining more water, do you know? Or was oh, it- Oh, they were consuming the same amount. They were just bashing the water thingy more. Hmm, gotcha. Yeah. They were just fidgety, more restless. Okay, our next question is from Zachary Sanchez. Hey, um, so I'm actually gonna ask a little bit later what I have. What is the pro 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 process like for so selecting your candidates for this microbiomics experiment when you're doing across countries and you're trying to look at that? Like, are you taking the consideration cultural diet on the findings that you're getting from that? No, we'll pretty much do anyone. Um, so, so we know that the diets are really, really different in, in these, in these places. Um, my, my, my postdoc and grad student, Victor and Liam actually took photos of, <laughs> of what they'd eat in these different countries and it was re radically different. So, um, uh, no, they, they just have to meet basic criteria of, um, 
I think they had a normal BMI and hadn't been sick and this kind of thing. But um, we, we're okay with them all having different diets. So, so that might be maintaining and driving some of the strain differences. We're, we're looking for the, for the evolutionary relationships between the strains as well as that. Thank you. Okay, our next question will be coming from Katie McCormick. Hi, I had a question about sort of the what biologically was driving the sort of co-occurrences of the different uh, microbes with the Christian Selenacea. Uh -huh. I was wondering if there was anything in common across the different microbes that seem to be co-occurring with it in the microbiome. Um, so besides the methanogens, all the others are from these completely bizarre groups with no cultured representatives. Um, but I think we could probably l see if we could look at the genomes and infer something. Um, my favorite hypothesis is that they're all hydrogen utilizers and that um, Chris and Sinella is just really, really good at, at producing a lot of hydrogen. And, and when you grow it, um, it, it makes all these bubbles. I mean, it, it really is um, really geared towards making hydrogen. So that would be my guess, but I don't have any evidence for that. Okay. Um, our next question is from Brian Ferrer. Uh, hi, Dr. Lay. Um, I have sort of a fun, like speculative question, I guess, but on the um, slide where you were talking about the bifido microbes and sort of their like compensatory mechanism with the human uh, gut microbiome, um, do you think that there would be some kind of like variation with you or like under antibiotic treatment? Because um, obviously that would affect like the percent like composition in the gut microbiome. Do you think like you'd see like full recovery of the bifidos or do you think like they would get like kind of overrun or over colonized by other microbes in the gut? I kind of think they'd, they'd recover. I mean, if you think about it, like bifidos are really common in Westerners and uh, we've been taking antibiotics for 50 years and we've been giving tons of them to the, our kids and yet they're, they always have bifidos. So I, they, they seem to be doing okay under our antibiotic rich you know, regime. I don't know if that answers your question, but they, they, yeah, they're still here. <laughs> so, I, of course, the right antibiotic at the right time might knock some of them out, but um, but we still have them. Yeah. Thank you. Great. We have time for one or two more questions. If um, we're through everyone in the chat, if somebody who didn't get a question into the chat would like to ask one. Okay. Well, I think similarly to the question that was just asked, do you think that the bifida composition can be altered by the consumption of bifida containing dairy products such as the oh. Activia? A, so generally, no. Uh, but, but there was one study out of, uh, that uh, Jens Walter did recently uh, showing that if there's a particular empty niche and you happen to add just the right bifida, yes, you can get engraftment. So, I think it's very context specific and, and which bifidos you might be adding. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I had a question concerning the, uh, from the very beginning of the presentation, the uh, lower weight and the BMI. Mm -hmm. um, and you spoke about butyrate production, that butyrate has been incriminated, uh, implicated, sorry, in uh, the development of bone. Um, and it has been shown that a suppression of butyrate producing agents leads to no bone development. So have you looked at bone density to explain difference oh. in BMI? So, so I, I don't think it's, uh, so, so what we see with butyrate is in vitro with just the two partners. Um, what happens in the whole microbiome, I, I think there's still gonna be plenty of butyrate production. Um, in fact, we measure it in, in the Strolly species people um, I, I would like to, I would like us to be able to figure out if you just have more hydrogen production generally in the microbiome, if you have a consistent shift in metabolite output, and if that does include lower butyrate, but I don't know. Um, I, I can tell you what happens in vitro, but that's, that's 
clearly going to be quite different in a, in a complex microbiome. So I wouldn't expect to see something that drastic. I mean, all okay. these people are, are pretty healthy. Um, and I think they've had plenty of butyrate. It's just that maybe they had less than another person. I don't, I don't know. Um, and I, and what we see in a two component system might, might not be what happens in the, in the whole microbiome. This is also the problem, right? That they, these guys all influence each other. Yeah. Thank you. The model it. Yeah. Great. So we are after one and we want to be conscious of folks time. Um, so we want to thank Dr. Lay for coming and talking to us again. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Ruth. That was fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thank for, you very much. Yeah. Thanks. I don't know if Seth has anything. Yeah. I'll hang on the line if uh, if anyone has any additional questions. But... I, you know, the cophylogeny result is astounding. I, I honestly didn't expect to see the number of taxa that you had found. Um, I'm curious if you were surprised by it, and if not, what do you think is driving the the vertical inheritance pattern? Um. So was I surprised? I don't know. I don't think I was surprised. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think it's, I think the more we look, the more we'll find, you know, we're, we're limited by depth of coverage and so on. Um, certainly seems that that now that your work's really going to pave the way for a broader view of this pattern. I hope, you know, so for, for us, um, so this is all very new and we've got the mothers and the babies. And so we can, we're now testing for strain sharing, right, between the moms and the babies to see yep. if the ones that are giving us the patterns of cophylogeny are more likely to be shared because that's what we would predict. Yeah. So don't have that yet. <laughs> That'll be exciting. It's That'll like, be very exciting. Work faster. Work faster. Um, um, I can join your group and help out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, it's, I, and I, and I, and I, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking it's it's kind of a pattern of three. Like, is this really real? Do we, or or is it? You know, you don't expect it to pop up this frequently. Um, are people gonna believe this? Is it is a it pattern just, of three? Is it a pattern of three, or is it a pattern of individual by individual? Well, it is. Yeah. Individual, right? Cophylogeny. Yeah. That's yeah, super yeah. strong. That's really yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. So, so then, so then you ask, well, what's so special about these ones? And, and actually, you know, some of them don't surprise me, like the bifidos, because we already know from people that those are, that those match mother baby. Um, and then I didn't show you actually the, like the null hypothesis versions, but they look like pom-poms where it's all mixed up. So if I showed you E. coli, I should add that. If I showed you E. coli, you'd just see a blur of color, right? Yeah. Like nothing there. Yeah. Um, which is, so it's fascinating to think that some of these microbes are just flying around and others are very you know, sticking to the people. Um, and so it, it's going to be fascinating to match them up with what we know about their ecology and how they're transmitted and, and then why they're so faithful, yeah. why they're faithful. And then just how faithful are they? So, you know, start looking at the expats and like what you're doing with ethnicity. Um, does that blur it or are they still faithful? Um, That's so right. It's, it's really fun to tease some of this stuff apart. Um, oh yeah, it's, it's incredibly exciting. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm glad you're interested. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, I have to ask a question about about phages and all of this because especially for heritable bacteria why would it not be advantageous for a phage to to piggyback on that so because i i haven't seen in any of the um at least the heritable bacteria that i've checked in, including Kristen, that one I yeah. say its name right but I, I haven't seen any phages integrated into those genomes like there's portions of it but they're yeah Oh, that's really interesting. So, so you think there's something about them? This there's something about the heritable set that they're not going to have phages integrated. That yeah, I, I at least I haven't seen in any of the studies that have been published that in those genomes that that there are phages there, and so I think it, it's it's interesting evolutionarily that in a population um, like the gut microbiome that that there isn't. Isn't... I just kind of naively assume that all gut bacteria, had right? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, so maybe they 
they're, because they're so successful at, at being heritable and they're so persistent that they have yeah. some kind of way to to they avoid infection or something. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. That would be fascinating to look at, yeah. yeah. Brittany views the world from page on up. So it's yes. always page first. I said, Maya taught me that, so it's, yeah. Uh-huh. Can't get I, it out I of my head. I do it. Pages make my head spin. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. I like that, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're brave. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. It was really yeah. great. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for all the great questions. So have a good rest of the day.